I thought we'd uh, do two main sets of things. I want to talk to you about your signature culture because I think it is so interesting to all of us. Uh, and then at some point we'll pivot from that into talking a little bit more generally about leadership, leadership style, and uh, how you approach leadership. And then we'll leave some time for uh, questions uh, from the audience and we'll wrap up um, at the end. Um, so talk to me about you know, some of these signature pieces uh, of the culture that I referred to uh, in my in my opening remarks, the, the idea of mayor and, and village and teammates, um, you know, the dress up, uh, the chanting that I that I heard backstage. Um, what, what's the story behind uh, behind all of this? Yeah, so uh, we we believe we're a community first and a company second. I mean, hopefully everybody has some communities that they're a part of in their life. Could be their family. Could be their book club, could be their church, could be the sports team, could be their best friends. Uh, community basically means that people care about each other, respect each other, and they care about the organization that they're a part of, that they're stewards that care about what they give on to the next generation, that that's basic concept of community. And, uh, and so we believe in that fervently, that, that given we spend more than 50% of our waking hours as an adult uh, at work, and for some of us it's way more than 50%, especially if you travel, uh, that to concede that in any way that shouldn't be central to your life mission and that you shouldn't be uh, emotionally engaged with the people that you work with all that time, we think is a grotesque concession that, that some people have to make uh, and, and a lot of people don't have to. And people like the ones in this room are going to have a spectacularly big impact on the folks that work for you uh, through the course of your life. And so, so we, we said, okay, we're going to be a community, act like a community, let's call it a village, uh, let's make it the mayor, because that raises the bar of expected behavior for us. And so we, we take it very seriously when we make decisions. We, we consistently use the metaphor, if you were mayor of a village, how would you decide? Because uh, if you're mayor of a village, you care about the economy, but the economy is the means to an end, it's not the end. You want a healthy economy so you can have good schools, good parks, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I have to say, I mean, I, I alluded to, you know, what happened uh, in the green room before, but it, but it is very impressive. I mean, so here you are meeting up with a, a bunch of folks from, you know, the local area who you don't do this with every day, and yet you were able to lead them through a series of, of cheers, which are clearly deeply ingrained and, um, and done, as you can see, by just looking around the room with, you know, with a, with a sense of passion and buy-in. Which, of course, is, is critical to having a culture. We can talk yeah. about culture all we like, but, but getting it bought in uh, in that way deeply through a Fortune 500 company, I mean, that's tough. So can you tell us a little bit, how, how do you go about that? How do you do that? It was, well, first, teammates, stand up. What the heck? Uh, we got some teammates here. So. So I knew. I knew there were going to be a couple here, but I didn't know it would be a bunch. Uh, uh, and so this was a pleasant surprise right before. So I will ask them three questions. Stay standing. Did, what is this company? You. Whose company is it? Ours. And what could it be? Special. And if we are to build the greatest healthcare community the world has ever seen, let it be like this one for all. All right. Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> So th this part wasn't uh, conscious when we started this adventure, um, and it kind of popped up organically. And, and what we find is that healthy tribes, uh, military units, religions, sports teams, places that have strong sense of team, strong sense of community, they do call and response. A language means something. Yeah. Ritual means something. And so we said, if we're going to be a community, we should have the attributes of a healthy religion, tribe, village. Uh, and it turns out call and response is, is what happens naturally in those quarters. Doesn't happen naturally in most, most companies right. because they're sort of morally sterile. <laughs> no, no value judgment implied. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I said sort of. <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is pretty uh, amazing to, to watch, but how do, you, how do you know that works? I mean, I, obviously, you know, it, it, it works in that you're able to perpetuate it, but how do you know that you're distinctive because of it? How do you know that you're getting superior results because of it? Yeah, so, so we, we're very metric oriented, and if you're, if you're gonna be serious about being a community, you gotta be objective. Um, and we certainly, not all of our neighborhoods are happy neighborhoods, uh, but 
uh, but our clinical outcomes are, 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 are superior to our competition. The government just came out with a new rating system, for example. Only 30% of all the centers in America in dialysis, which is one of our two big businesses, can be ranked a four or a five. And the, the percentage of our centers that are in that, those four or five categories is twice as high as any competitor. So it's a, a, a crushing example. In addition, we did an acquisition, about a $3 billion acquisition X years ago. We, paid, we did, did all the analysis. Our wages were the same. Our salaries were the same. We were in all the same geographies across America. Their turnover was 40% higher. So they, 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 if we were them, we would have had to hire an extra 1,200 people a year compared to what we had to do, given the difference in retention at the same pay across America. And third, there's some of the big consulting firms, the Ands, the Hewitts, that do standard questions across big companies. And our teammate engagement scores are, are quite high. And then I'll give one anecdote. About five, six years in, a woman came up to me at a big conference and said they'd been hired by a pharmaceutical company to do focus groups with patients. And, and they had never worked for us. They were never going to work for us. And, and she said, by the third city, uh, uh, we were playing a game. Because you know, that's where you have a facilitator. And then, and then the sponsors are behind a mirror looking at the people and the 15 patients answering these questions, just like they do with cars and toothpaste. And, and all that, and, and, and she said, by the third city, we played a game that about 40 minutes in, since they didn't ask the question of, do you know who owns and operates your dialysis center until the very end, about 40 minutes into it, they'd play a game and guess which patients were the DaVita patients? Because you could tell that they talked differently. And this, at this point, was across a thousand different locations, small locations across America. That was, for us, one of the, separate from all those hard metrics, that was perhaps the most special one, that human beings talked differently. So you, you, you spoke a little bit about some acquisitions and spreading culture through acquisitions. And the one that you refer to is one where uh, it was really a like business model, but you were, you were taking the culture uh, to that. And of course, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you, you bought HBC, which is uh, in a quite different business, related but different business. Right. And so uh, have you tried to take the same culture there? Uh, are there limits to the extent to which you can transfer the culture to? Yeah. Well, both the big dialysis company, when we bought them, they were horrified at the notion of being subjected to this weird shit. You know, the, uh, yeah, that uh, they said it looks like a cult. That's a technical term. The, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, a term. It's, uh, I'm just quoting them. Um, the, that it seems like a cult, it seems sophomoric, uh, it seems cheesy, it seems inappropriate, cavalier. Um, and both there and then with this related business three years ago, they were similarly uh, worried about, about uh, being subjected to it, forced to try to adopt it. We made very clear in rooms like this, only not as nice, we can't afford nice rooms like this. The, uh, um, they make very clear, please don't use our language uh, unless and until it becomes comfortable. Uh, that don't, don't, don't talk about, uh, don't feel like you have to talk about our, our values or some of our concepts or the village. Don't do any of that. Get to know us, watch how we behave, watch how we interact, and then a year downstream, we'll, we'll talk about whether or not we need to change any of the values or whatever. And both the first time and the second time, legacy DeVita veterans were appalled uh, that I would say that we might change them. Uh, but m my response was, if you're a village, you have to represent the current population. And, and when you have a lot of new people, it's a new thing, and you need to speak for that new community. And in the case of this related acquisition, uh, that from a business point of view, the first two years went very poorly. Tremendous organizational change. We took out half the senior executives. So a relatively traumatized organization, which exacerbated the fear around you know, one hell of a village. You, you, know, you let half the people go, and you're introducing all this change. Um, and so in the second nationwide meeting, since the time we closed the deal, once a year we get our top 4,000 leaders or so together, I went off in a room with the 270 leaders from that enterprise. 18 months in, traumatic 18 months, and said, okay, now we're gonna have a debate. Do you wanna go uh, adopt the legacy DeVita vision, mission, and values? Do you wanna keep what you have, wait another year, keep it forever, or somewhere in between? And it was a very intense debate. Uh, about, about 80 out of the 250 people or so were physicians, uh, people from all over America, new, some were new to the enterprise, because the acquisitions have been done post close some have been there 25 years. Uh, they went through it, and, and about halfway through, a woman stood up, and it was a very intense debate. A woman stood up, and one thing we didn't have on the ballot was 
go all in, to take, take the vision, mission, and values. We put, you can take these two, these two, or just one or none, because we never thought it would go all in. Well, this one woman stood up and said, you know what, you know, I've, been, I've been now, you know, it's been a year and a half since the deal. This, uh, we have wonderful people in our company, Healthcare Partners. They have wonderful people in Legacy, DeVita. They are living the values that we all agree with, with far more intentionality and follow through and purpose and robustness than we are. And I wanna be one company. I vote for all in. I think that should be added to the ballot. Applause broke out in the room. We had another hour of debate, both in small groups and big groups. And at the end of that two and a half hours, the 260 or so leaders from that enterprise voted 85% to go all in. 14 of the remaining 15 voted to go two thirds of the way in, only 1% voted. So, so they, they voted for, embraced the village concept themselves, uh, much I think to their own surprise. No one knew what the outcome was gonna be going into that room and therefore there was no one subjected to anything. And they went out and told everybody across America that we just, you know, I've, I've sort of, I'm taking this stuff more seriously now, and in fact, I just voted for it. And has it taken root? I'd say you know, the, the math I use uh, is I think we're about one third teammate citizens, uh, maybe more, maybe 33 to 40%. We're about 30, 35%, you know, just still watching, observing and then whatever number is left uh, are, are still negative. Yeah, so st still on the, on, on the subject of uh, exporting the, the culture, uh, you've taken uh, DeVita now internationally. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, some of the challenges in, in taking this kind of corporate culture to, yeah. to other, other national cultures? Yeah, the, uh, uh, this has been, it's been very intense. Uh, the, so first, when you think about core values, some people will look at them on a wall and say, yeah, it's motherhood and apple pie. Who doesn't believe in integrity? Who doesn't believe in team? What a dumb, you know, pointless list. Everybody believes in them. As a leader, the, the issue is not belief, it's practice. So yeah, I believe in all those things. If you evaluate exactly how I behave every day, some people would say, hey, KT, I'm not so sure you're living that core value that you believe in. And even harder to create an environment where everybody practices them. And, and not violating a core value does not equal living it. So if I go a month without telling a lie, that is not living a life of integrity. Living a life of integrity is when you sit, tell the truth when it hurts, when it's mm. embarrassing, when you didn't have to. Uh, if I go a month without blaming someone for something they didn't do, I'm not living the core value of accountability. You, living the core value of accountability is when someone makes a mistake and, and no one thinks you had anything to do with it and you realize that you knew the person wasn't very good about that you could have taken them aside two weeks ago for half an hour. They never would have made the mistake. And you stand up and take accountability because you said, you know what? I could have prevented that. I know Josh was uncertain or whatever. And so there's a big difference between not violating and living. And it's, con and it's contagious how that works. Um, and so internationally, when we decided to go, if I was a better CEO, we would have gone international 10 years ago. But I wasn't, so we started four years ago. And I went to other CEOs from prestigious business schools like Stanford, and, and they all said, you know, that, that weird stuff you do, leave it at the airport. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's unusual even in America, so don't you dare try to do it in Saudi Arabia, don't you dare try to do it in China, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, Poland, Portugal, uh, Colombia, I mean, all these other, India, all these other places we are. So I took their advice. And, and then I was giving a talk to a bunch of our Indian teammates, X months later as we began to grow, and it just fell totally flat. And so I went to the boss after, I knew him enough he was honest, he gave me that gift. I said, well that was, it really fell flat. And he said, they, they've all been on the internet. They, if you go walk around their cubicles, they've got the DeVita mm. symbols up. They've got the story of how our neighborhood has grown within the context. And now they're feeling like this village thing, that's just about America. And they're not really mm. citizens, they're just you know, foreign laborers. Uh, and so we, I voicemailed back, we changed, we, we went full on, uh, and, and in doing that, you find out that it's about human values, that everyone wants to have a, a robust discussion around actual human values and whether or not they're used in making day-to-day -day business decisions or not. It's not a fairy tale thing. Um, and, and we've had uh, uncomfortable moments in some of the cultures as we work through, in particular, for example, because we won't stand for some of the gender discrimination that exists uh, in a lot of other societies and, 
that leads to awkwardness and, and then one other moment of awkwardness and then I'll, I'll stop the... Uh, so you have, trying to get the right translation is not always straightforward. Um, and, uh, and so it turns out in one country, uh, the word that we were using for fulfillment basically means masturbation. <laughs> and, and so we were saying, you know, fulfillment's very important. <laughs> we think everyone should be fulfilled. <laughs> You know, even we hold our leaders accountable for fulfillment. <laughs> and, and then someone gave the speaker, was well, not me, the gift of, so there are speed bumps on uh, the way. And, and you had metrics to track. Yeah, yes, you know. right. uh, so, I mean, probably true of your, of your days at Bain, but when we teach uh, strategy, we talk, of course, about alignment between, between organization, including culture and, and strategy. But then we also talk about Alignment between that and the external environment that you, that you find yourself in, industry and so on. So, so the question really is, um, how general do you think um, this kind of, the applicability of this kind of culture is? I mean, is, is this something that works in, in, in mission-driven healthcare, uh, mission-driven kinds of industries? Is this something that you think could be applied uh, more broadly? What are, what are the limits? Uh, this one, this is one where we're quite intense because a lot of people will kind of go, oh, they're nice little healthcare service people. You know, I'm sure it'd be very, very pleasant to talk to, but they probably lose all their football games. And, uh, and we, over the last 16 years, are in the top 5% of New York Stock Exchange performers. We outperform our competition in clinical outcomes. And a lot of our teammates have gone on to be CEOs and COOs of lots of other companies. So we, we, we don't think there's any tension between achieving uh, uh, capitalistic and market-based and net worth ambitions and creating a healthy and distinctive community for people to work. We think there's no, no tension between those. In fact, we think they're in some ways cohabitate very positively. And so if, if, if I was running a, uh, an enterprise with 3,000 Taco Bells, uh, not, not medical clinics, or a coal mine, or any, it, it is all about creating a differentially healthy environment for people to work, particularly the people that don't have the career options and income and flexibility that, that most of us in this room have. Uh, that, that, that that applies to any business, that we, a, a healthy workplace is a gift to that mommy or that daddy that they will take home. Uh, it is a gift that they will uh, savor at work, and it's about basic ways in which humans behave with one another. So we believe passionately that it's transferable everywhere. That's not to say that there aren't uh, differences in how one would implement and how it manifests itself in a in a Goldman Sachs or a Bain and Company uh, or, or versus uh, other organizations, um, that the, the, demogra the, the, the demographics of the citizenship uh, does affect uh, it. But the basic principles have to do with how we behave with one another and whether or not it's consistent with the, with the values that we allege to hold dear. And so I'd, I'd like to start to transition to leadership and keep, keep one foot in culture and put put one foot in, um, in leadership. Um, so, you know, some of the things that, that we're talking about, uh, you know, village, mayor, community, you know, sound, sound soft. They sound, they sound soft, they sound a little bit squishy, uh, very GSB-esque, actually. Hmm. Um, we're, we're also, I was gonna say it. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, all, we're also heavily into, in, into costumes, which you, you, you call uniforms, uh, so see a parallel there as well. Um, but, at the end of the day, you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and uh, that's a tough role. That requires tough decision making. It requires holding people accountable. You know, that doesn't sound so soft and squishy, actually. And so I'm, I'm just wondering how how much of this translates into your your day to day job. How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. And 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 Liz, if at some point the video is ready, we can play it. The uh... oh, okay, didn't okay. Um, the, it's, I think it's where the metaphor comes in so handy. If, if you're the mayor of a village, everyone knows the village has to have a healthy economy in order to create jobs for people to have. Everybody knows you got to pay taxes to support the school system and the police. So, and, but there's serious issues of who should pay how much tax, how transparent is the deployment of 
the tax funds that are raised, how competent are the organizations that spend the tax money. Um, and so we think of profits to the shareholder like that. So we're very open about it, that, that we don't get to create the Davide University that our people love with a tremendous emphasis on personal reflection and introspection, not just applied stuff. We don't get to grow and create career opportunities. We don't get to grow and create profit sharing awards un 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 unless we are allocated capital, which is just like a mayor has got to collect tax money in order to do all the things that citizens want to exist, the parks and the summer programs. And so you, st and, and we find that, you, that it doesn't matter. We have, we have 18,000 folks out of our 65,000 that have not been to college and never will. They understand the concepts totally about what real life is like if they feel you're honest uh, and transparent about what reality is and are willing to have real debates. So I've gotten up in front of thousands of our teammates and talked about my compensation and executive compensation with people making $17 an hour. Uh, and then they get the right to ask questions or send, send messages. So, so first, there's, there's an issue of, 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 the, of just basic, straightforward honesty and transparency and explanation. To, to kind of loop things together in a way that, that otherwise doesn't work. And then second, when we talk about tough decisions, you know, we, we will discuss them in the, in, the, in the context of the metaphor. I'll give one example. Uh, we made that big acquisition I referred to. Well, the, the government was appropriately going to require us to do some divestitures. Uh, and when you do divestitures, what the FTC requires is that you either, you either divest all the DeVita, legacy DeVita centers or all of the new companies. You can't pick and choose because you would cherry pick all the best market positions and so you can't do that. It's, it's a reasonable federal policy. Everybody assumed, and I mean everybody assumed that, that I would decide to divest all centers from the company we were buying. And some of these folks will, would have been in, in, the, in this part of this. Um, and, uh, and I said no. If, if the other company that we're buying has got a group that's on the ascendancy that is the clear long-term winner, then we will divest the DeVita, legacy DeVita centers. People were appalled that, you know, this is a violation. We love the village. We've been good citizens of the village. We have excellent clinical outcomes. And you're going to sell us to, to, you don't even know who you're going to sell it to. And we can't even switch and work because the way the FTC rules work, you can't, you know, take all the employees. You got to, as a certain hands-off period. In our case, teammates on employees, they call them employees. Um, and so people are livid. And I, I got up in a room, a much bigger room, with 3,000 of our leaders and, and explained that, that job one of a mayor of a village is to make sure the village is sustainable for the long term. Because every single one of us talking to them is going to leave the village at some time because we get a great job offer, because we retire, because our spouse gets transferred. And so we are all stewards for the next set of people in these chairs and for maintaining an environment where we can provide superb care for our patients. That's job one. And just like if you're mayor of a village and you know you got to put a highway in or your downtown's going to deteriorate and you're going to lose to some other village, you know you got to rip down houses to put in that highway. And some of those people will have lived in those houses for 25 years, love their neighborhood, and you're going to rip down their house to put in a frickin' highway. But that's the right thing, either that or the place goes dead in 30 years and got up and, and explained why I had decided what I had decided. And about 70% of the people being divested came up after, most of them crying, saying that they, they accepted the logic, that the decision was best for the village, and that was consistent with my responsibility. And they were very sad, uh, but understood. So, so we, it's, we, we put it together uh, because you know, life, life yeah. is hard sometimes. And, and how much of this translates to decision-making with your core team? I mean, you know, you're talking about the, the village at large, but when you, you bring this back to core management team, what, what, what are some of the tough decisions you've made? Are there, are there times where you've had to go against the wisdom uh, of the core team and say, yeah. you know, I am the mayor. This, I think this is, the, this is the right decision. Yeah, there have been uh, a couple. We, we do a lot of votes compared to most organizations, votes with thousands of people involved, sometimes hundreds of people involved. Um, but I, I always retain the, uh, the right to overrule the vote. I mean, it's the discussion that matters, and, and the data is very useful for me and for others. But in the end, uh, I have the job I have that should come with differential insight and, and should carry with it a differentiated experience. Some people would question that. <laughs> it's, um, and, and so uh, we had uh, one, one business uh, that, uh, that I wanted to buy, 
and the entire team voted against it. So I hired Bain, and then they came out and recommended against it. <laughs> so we stopped that project. And, uh, and I, I, I told, I pulled out of the process, and then I went home that weekend, and I just said, our, 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 our alleged vision at that point, because we were just kidney care at that point, was to transform kidney care in America, which we're halfway there. And this was 13 years ago. And we cannot get the, we cannot seriously try to do that unless we buy this thing, even though right now it's little and broken and there's no pro forma you can do that makes sense, that we have to change a bunch of laws to do a lot of things. And I went back on, on Monday and, and told the team, you know, we, we're, we're going to buy it. Mm -hmm. And I respect all the, the reasons. Um, but it's not, it's not inconsistent with our construct. Uh, and then I guess the, the other part, if it was implicit in the question about core team, yeah, the, I am sensitive to the fact that, uh, that there are times that I behave in ways that are inconsistent with our mission and values, and particularly with my core team, when you say bring it back to that. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where one hopes that you've scored enough points in terms of intentionality that people forgive you for your behavioral transactional shortcomings. Do they call you on it? Do they feel comfortable enough to call you on it? Do you, do you, mean, do you apologize for it? How, how, do, how does that go? I'd say that's, uh, and I'd be curious what some of the teammates say. Uh, the, I think we're, we're, uh, we're seriously above average in people being willing to call us on it. I get scored in the core values every year. An independent consultant goes out and talks to a lot of folks. My scores are made public to the board and to the teammates, as well as a bunch of comments. Uh, so I don't get to change them. Uh, and, and then we'll talk about high and, and low scores. Uh, we, we take, uh, as it's sort of self-evident, that, that, uh, that we all have bad stretches, that we all have faults, and, and that if you can't create an environment where you talk about them, each of our personal growth journeys are going to be stunted. And so we do a lot of introspection, a lot of reflection, a lot of discussion. And in the second part of every executive's review is uh, after I, for example, when I'm reviewing others, the first part is the most important message. The second part is to go through each core value and talk about how other people's experience you with respect to integrity. How do they experience you with respect to fun? How do they experience you with respect to service excellence? Real words. Um, and so, and then I get the same back. Um, so I think we, we help me and we help each other grow as human beings and so I think we're, we're reasonable on, the, on mm -hmm. that. So um, we're, most of the, the first years have been taking a course here, which we call Leadership Labs. Uh, one of the things we, we talk to them about uh, in the labs is, is being active learners, uh, and, and being active learners their whole, their whole lives, their whole careers. You know, constantly learn from what went well, what, what didn't go well, become, become a better manager, leader. Um, you've spoken about some of the ways you're, you're getting feedback, but, but, but what are some of the other ways that you personally have worked on your own uh, leadership and management skill over time? Well, so, so one of our pitter patters is management is a business skill. It's really important, so you should study it and think rigorously about it. Leadership uh, is a human thing, not a business thing. It, and if you want to get better at leadership, learn more about humans, starting with yourself. And so virtually every DeVita University class has elements of introspection and self-reflection. And, uh, and particularly if you have as, have as many uh, behavioral deficiencies as I have, you, you, uh, we try to make sure, not just through the 360 process, but through using other tools and, and outside coaches that you're continuously forced to reflect on yourself. Uh, and, uh, and, and that combined with having to discuss yourself publicly is a, is a tremendous uh, spur, uh, a thing that can spur your, your growth. For me, to work on some of my behavioral things, uh, I have done things like give myself a score every day. So when I took this job 16 years ago, I was 43. When you still have serious behavioral issues, which many of you will have, you know, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. I mean, overall, I got some good scores, but I had things I had to work on. When you're 43 and you've been a C CEO already for eight years, that, that means there's some, there's some stuff going on. I mean, you're not just going to get the feedback and then suddenly the next day stop entirely. 
And so for some of those things, uh, I use the metaphor of it's, my, my, my brother is, is an alcoholic. He's now 11 years sober. And when he talks about the early years, he said, you know, I had to win that battle against alcoholism every day. And so for some of my behavioral deficiencies, like getting angry uh, with people, uh, I started giving myself a daily score and tracked it on a spreadsheet because I, I had to build the, the muscle memory to, to catch myself first after I did it, yeah. and then I could go apologize if I had the courage, and then catch myself while I was doing it, and, and then catch myself right before I was gonna do it. And, and then after about two years, I, I was doing it a lot less. But if I had not kept a daily score to confront my reality while it was still fresh, and I couldn't then just sort of consistently dismiss it as, you know, as a bad day, or the person, you know, has been bugging me for a while, then all the rationalizations get stripped away when you score yourself every day. Did you have a drink or not? Did you have too many drinks or not? It just is the reality. It is you. It's not the external world. Fascinating. Um, I, want, I want to go back uh, a little bit um, uh, in, in your career because I think it's of, of interest to the, the student bodies. They're thinking about you know, where, to go, where to go next from, from the GSB. Um, you did spend uh, a good spell uh, at Bain. Um, there's, there's a lot you learn in, in, in a gig like that. Um, and I'm wondering about the transition from that to being CEO of, a, of an operating company. Uh, what did you learn at Bain that, that was helpful? Are there, are there some things you, you learned at Bain that you, that you had to unlearn? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about the transition? Well, first of all, as to ideas for where you should go after business school, I have, I have one, <laughs> yeah, but we'll come back to that. Um, the, uh, on the Bain versus operating company thing, uh, back when I graduated, which was a long time ago, uh, there, at that, in that decade, in my mind, the, the, there weren't really a lot of operating companies that had thoughtful programs for growing general managers and leaders. And that's, that's what we're about. And that's what I wanted to become. I knew you know, my dream was to become a, a competent general manager and, and leader of people. That's, I knew that's what I wanted to become proficient at. And, uh, and I, did not, I did not see Stuff. I, there were jobs out there, but they, they weren't about that. They were, they were just about learning the, the business. And, and then in consulting more generally, you know, my, the way I would advise young people is if, if you want to be a general manager leader in the long term, that, and you find you're, you're, the, you're the sort of person who's super, super bright, you figure out the case faster than other people, you can, you can uh, you're very uh, verbally adroit connected to your brain, that, uh, but you're not a natural team leader. You're not, a nat you're not a natural team builder. Uh, you're, you're not natural in establishing trust. Well, you got to stare at that very realistically, um, because if you want to be a general manager leader and you have that mix relative to the world, doesn't you know? There's no good or bad in this. And you go to consulting or investment banking, you, you, your existing muscles get way, way stronger, and your pay goes up, and these other muscles stay weak. And then you want to make a shift, and it's a nightmare because you got to take a huge cut in pay and work on your remedial mm -hmm. capabilities. And so you don't do it, and i got a lot of friends who are 59 and wealthy and not happy because they, they went too much, uh, they, they didn't have a good strategy. Similarly, uh, if, uh, if you're great at, the, at project management and team leadership and the rest, uh, which I felt for me, that was some of my natural, natural sport for me, a lot to learn, but a natural sport, uh, but you need help in more strategic discipline, uh, more analytical discipline. You need to just be exposed to a lot more. Then it goes the other way, that you know, you, you're going there and getting that incredible exposure and learning those disciplines, and then you transfer over to a sport you were sort of born to play. Um, and, and so I think it's very, there, there's no generic answer. It's very person-specific, and it requires incredible intellectual honesty about your strengths and weaknesses and, and where you want to end up. Um, and so for me, I needed, I needed exposure. Uh, I needed to, to run with that, that sort of uh, intellect with people for a while to make me sharper, uh, help me grow. Uh, I needed to become more disciplined analytically. I needed all those things, and, and I got them big time, mm -hmm. uh, and then went to, to play where I always knew, I mean, the sport I wanted to play. Good, thank you. Uh, 
I, I don't want to. I don't want to hog all your time. Uh, let's uh, let's instead uh, open it up for for questions from from the audience. I have the first question from Twitter. How do you distinguish company as community from company as a family? How does one, for instance, fire a community member? Uh, yeah, actually, when you asked about tough moments, um, firing a friend, and in some cases, someone you literally love, is a brutal thing to have to do. And, and particularly, if they love the village, uh, and you have that personal relationship, and then you tell them they have to go. Um, and, uh, and, and we use the community, which of course is made up of families, uh, very explicitly because the family thing, while there, that level of intimacy exists in some of our neighborhoods and some of our smaller teams, for us, some of the, my senior executive team, we, we, we love each other uh, as we love our oldest, dearest friends, uh, and we talk about it. And, uh, and so we are uh, almost like families. But for the bear community, that would be an overly aggressive word. It would just be inaccurate to say the entire 65,000 people across 12 countries is a family. It just it would be an inappropriate metaphor. Uh, the just like a village has families within it. That's 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 just more accurate. We're serious about the metaphor. If you're gonna, if it's gonna, if it's gonna help you make decisions and help you talk about decisions and help people understand how you want to behave, it's got to be real. It's got to make sense. It's got to be internally holistically consistent. Um, and so the ones there, we, I'm much better at this. I used to be bad at giving people bad reviews and bad at terminating because I was too intent on proving I was right. I'm right about the ways you underperformed. I'm right about it's the right decision to terminate you. And then, and then one of my uh, executives who worked for me, a guy named Tom Usselton, taught me uh, what I thought about conceptually but had never applied to that area, which is the whole issue of intentionality. Until I got to the point where I intended to be helpful to that person uh, in the review or in the decision, helpful, uh, I could never become very good at doing it. And, and as I went through my year or two of learning that uh, from this gentleman, I, there were times I canceled the meeting because I knew I was still going in with my old tendency to want to prove I was right uh, and, and, and take care of, uh, respond to any rebuttal. Um, and so if you go into it with the right intention in your heart, uh, your head will do just fine by itself. Uh, and in a, in a village, uh, you, you got to maintain the health of the village. And it doesn't mean they're going to be you know, destroyed. There's, there are other jobs. There are other villages. In many cases, there are people who won't take a demotion. And so in that case, it becomes their own decision to go. It, it turns out a, a majority of successful executives have a really hard time with a demotion. I think that's totally philosophically inappropriate and shallow. Uh, the, uh, but it's where most human beings come from. Uh, shallow is not the right word, um, but I think in many cases they would have been happier. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, putting it in the right context, having the right intentionality, um, and then being respectful and humane. Hi, uh, my name is Fernanda. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, the intentional parts of the culture. So in the beginning here you were saying, uh, oh, what we just did, that was not my intent when we started off. And I'm sure a lot of things evolved through the years, but I would like to hear about your vision in the very beginning and your role as a leader in, in making that vision come true. Yeah, I mean, let me uh, take a stab at it and then you uh, come back if I don't hit it right. And intentionality is, is fundamental and we just, for example, I had a big, I was just with 10 people last night in Denver who just went through uh, uh, something that I'll describe as part of our intentionality, and, and that was the first word they used. Uh, then now there are a couple of big groups that are thinking of joining us, and, and when that happens, we just invite them to come to our big meetings. Uh, so, so a part A and a part B. Uh, first, when, when, when I showed up, and, and, there were, and for reasons we can go into later perhaps, it was a big, big, big family decision, uh, I, I did announce to the, to the groups like this that, that number one, uh, I, I wanted to create a differentially healthy place for people to work and uh, have an unusual percentage of people say that it was the best place they ever worked. Not perfect, not easy, but the best place they ever worked. Uh, and number two is we wanted to build the greatest dialysis company the world ever seen. That, that is what I said. And we were on the verge of bankruptcy. We're being investigated by the SEC. We're being sued by shareholders. 
We had no COO, no CIO, no CFO. We were in six weeks of missing payroll on 9,000 people. And, and, and so when I said those words in that situation, a lot of people thought it was inappropriate emphasis given where we were. And, and in my mind, if you care about that stuff, the time to start working on it is right now. You, there's a, you'd never delay. It doesn't mean you don't, you, know, you have to do all the other stuff, but there's no such thing. The leaders lead. They don't wait for the right time to lead. Um, second, when I did that, you know, these, this room, you know, a third of the people thought it was just you know, manipulation, you know, superficial marketing, you know, hoity-toity MBA, wants us to stay, looks like we're going to go bankrupt. So this is like, you know, what he, what, if he wants us to stay, he shouldn't give us, you know, superficial football speeches like that. He should give us retention bonuses. And then maybe a third of the group, obviously, you don't know the, r the right numbers, uh, were, were thinking, well, that's you know, very nice. He seems sincere, but that'll last about a month. Uh, and then maybe a third of the group said, wow, I would like to work in a place that's differentially healthy place for human beings to work and has a, a dream of actually making a significant impact on the world. I, I would, I'd like that. I'm hoping he's sincere and he's competent. And, and if you've not done it yet, given a speech in a room where two thirds of the people think uh, you're full of it, it's not fun. Uh, it's not fun. But it demonstrates intentionality. And then, and then you say, and by the way, I know most of the people in the room think this is not pragmatic or not sincere or naive or whatever. And then they go, okay, so he actually knows that a bunch of us think it's BS. And he's still saying it. Now that's interesting. Because at first we just thought he was dumb or naive. Now we say he actually knows it. And he's still saying it. Um, and, and, then, and then people would, of course, say, how? And so, okay, that's what we got to figure out together. Yeah, you know, here's some ideas about, uh, about our policies around DeVita University. Here's some of our policies about helping teammates in need. Here's some, our, here's some of our, here's some, you know, brainstorming here and there on personal and professional development and impact on communities. And, 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 and so we started to demonstrate by having regular meetings where the only subject was, how do we make this notion of being a differentially healthy place to work come true? And, and just like if you had a marketing problem or a manufacturing problem, you, it was the agenda item. You would generate ideas. You would allocate resources. You would have programs. You would monitor the execution. So we, we respected the challenge. And we demonstrated that we were damn serious about it. And, and we used to get on the phone, as we still do, every eight weeks for a Voice of the Village call. I was just on one yesterday, about 5,000 people across the world. And in those days, every call, I'd say, what is the incremental evidence since the last call to suggest we're serious? about this mission and values stuff. And so, and so put it way, way out there. And then at some point, you, you call the question and say, OK. You know, we call it crossing the bridge. And we have a bridge in every neighborhood. I walk across the bridge every morning. Uh, and if you, after you've been with us six months, we ask you to stand at that bridge and, and decide you never have to tell us. And if you decide to walk across it, it means that you've declared that you share accountability for creating a differentially healthy place to work having us be a community first, and trying to have a differential impact on healthcare in the world. And so, and so it, it was very explicit. It was very much reinforced by actual actions, actual intellectual investment, actual project management, operating follow through, actual honest discussions about how we were doing. Um, because we, back then, we had 9,000 people across 450 locations. If you didn't get way intense, it's not like being able to call everybody in a room. Uh, it had to be much more serious. So I think those are some of the things uh, that really hammered home the intentionality and, and got a lot of people thinking about whether or not they wanted to cross the bridge. And then I'll throw out one other thing that was a powerful part of it. A bunch of managers in the first year crossed the bridge. They said, whoa, we, we, we believe this, and we're, we're psyched. It would be great to retire and say, I tried to build the greatest dialysis company the world ever seen. And, and have a differential. I, I'm, I'm on board. But when I go back to Tulsa or New York or whatever and talk to the 25 people in my little center, I can't bring that alive. And we're, we're open six days a week, three shifts a day. I can't even pull my team together, much less convey it all. And the videos help, but they're not enough. And so we're, we're like, you know, the, the village concept is sort of stopping at the manager level. And so we had town halls and their managers saying this to, to me and the other senior leaders. And, and we said, okay, how can we break through that? And, and then somebody had the you know, temerity to say, well, you know, we, we couldn't actually fly all our people somewhere like to go to meetings like we do and discuss this stuff. And, 
you know, because no, you can't because it's expensive and because it's really hard to get substitute staffing in all the local centers. And, and then we said, okay, but it appears we can't, we can't do what we say we want to do. The dream is not feasible unless we're willing to do something that we don't know if anyone else does. And so ever since that time, we have academies. They're two days long. Every teammate in America, and now increasingly in the world, is invited to come for two days. We have people who have never been on a business trip, lots of them. Some never been on a plane, don't have credit cards, never checked into a hotel. And then the vice president's right next to the doctor, is right next to the, the, uh, the tech, who's right next to the secretary. Uh, and it's two days with no applied training. Uh, it's all about our mission, our vision, our language, our rituals. Uh, people go through things like Myers-Briggs, and we have thousands of people who've never done that. And the second day, we ask everyone to write their personal credo, which is essentially a statement of life purpose. Uh, and then think about, how are they living a life consistent with, with what they would say their values and life mission is? And then do we, do we fit in it? And so when we started doing that, when we, when we told people across America, we will fly you for two days of discussion and have senior uh, executives there to help interact, that was a huge piece of data for people that we were, that we were serious. And, and still, all along the way, you, know, you're just, you had to go through waves of skepticism, cynicism, fatigue. You, know, you set a tough budget, and does that mean it's not a village? Did, was that reasonably responsive? I, th I think we have time for, for one more. Back. Can a non-citizen call you KT? Yes. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you, KT. It depends what words are in front or after it. <laughs> uh, can you speak a little bit more about the uh, disadvantages to having that strong of a culture, specifically for your leadership role? And on a more personal note, for you and for your citizens, uh, how does it, how does it, having your daytime job being that touchy feely, how does that impact your life at home and your relationship with your own family? Ooh. Um, on the first one, uh, which I think was, how does the, the, the strength and nature of the culture constitute, an, a, 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 where, is, where is it a disadvantage? You know, I, I, I can't, uh, I've not been asked that specific question and thinking spontaneously, I, I really am coming up empty. I, I think it's, I think it's a, uh, a, 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 it's always a good thing. Uh, now, sometimes it makes some stuff harder because you have to explain really delicate things that are uncomfortable, but that's sort of like the bridge you have to pass if you want a special culture is, that's inevitable. So I think it forces uncomfortable human behavior. Uh, it forces you to do stuff and me to do stuff I might not have the courage to do otherwise, but once you, you know, one of the things we tell young leaders is get out there and talk about your values out loud to the people that work for you. And it's intent, because a bunch of them will be looking and saying, oh, well, you think you live that value? You know, I'm not so persuaded. Uh, and, and the power of speaking out loud. So, so I think it forces moments of serious discomfort, but it's never a, a disadvantage, would be my, my pretty strong reaction, although I get the question. I'm not trying to be dismissive. Uh, and then in the second one, yeah, second one is uh, particularly thought-provoking, giving my my son, my little munchkin, is in the room. <laughs> um, the, um, but uh, but I, I believe that, uh, that the Davida Village has made me a, a better human being. And, uh, and I think, you know, obviously my kids have limited memories because I was ten, they were 10 and 8 when we started this adventure. Um, but, uh, but other people who, who know me throughout would talk about how it's fostered, it's fostered, forced, encouraged, motivated uh, growth as a human being. And I love most the letters we get uh, from people that have left uh, or when we give Core Value Awards, which we take very, very seriously, one of the rituals of our village, the annual Core Value Awards, and then they happen throughout the village of the year, are very, very serious events. There's no recognition on our night of honor for business accomplishments. It's all uh, human behavior. Uh, that, that, that often, I mean, for me, the most special ones, and often the, the remarks of the people who get it will say that I've been at DeVita six years and I'm a better daddy, I'm a better mommy, I'm a better daughter. Uh, that's, that's what we're about. It's, it's, for us, our culture is not a part of our business strategy. Our culture is about our, our dreams of, of what life should be like, and it just happens to be inserted into 
uh, a capitalistic enterprise. Um, so, uh, so I, I feel it's, it's why I'm, as my son will tell you, highly imperfect. Uh, I think it's made me way more mindful uh, at, at home. Uh, and, uh, and it's been de demanding, as, as some of you know, back 16 years ago, uh, when I took the job, uh, I had just come off a private equity-backed thing. I, I ran a company, it got taken over, it was very neat financially and really sad because we thought we were building something special. Then I did a private equity-backed thing with TPG and Bain Capital, uh, and it failed. And it failed largely because of mistakes I made, strategically and otherwise. And I had friends who moved their families across the country to join this company with me, and then a year and a half later, I had to tell them their job was being eliminated. And, and we ended up selling the piece of the company, losing half the money, and and, and in the face of that, and I was so I was working very hard to uh, try to save it and didn't, and and so when I when that was over, I told my wife and kids that I was uh, going to take six months off, and uh, and spend time with them and get healthier and the rest, and so when search firms would call, I would say, you know, I'm. Call me in six months. I'm, I'm going to take some downtime. I was within eight weeks of being done, and then, then they called for this company. And since I had run one other caregiving company before, it was the most professionally fulfilling time of my life. And uh, and so I went through a hellacious month with my wife Denise, who was also an HBS grad, was one of America's first female venture capital partners. About how much of my taking this job was ego. You want to make some more money, want to prove I can turn on a company, want to run a bigger company. Even though it was in another city, it was a total turnaround. My family wasn't going to move uh, versus how much of it was, was virtuous and had to do with having a positive impact in the world. And I wasn't sure about the answer. Uh, I knew it was a bunch of both. And, uh, and clearly we decided what we did and, and it was sort of pivotal in the end uh, was, was saying it's... It, it's the fact that it was going to be difficult was highly relevant, but it'd be one thing to be home five nights a week with your kids and talk to them about leading a purposeful life, and a whole other thing to be there fewer nights but lead one. And, and that's the gift that the village gave me. And so, uh, and so while it's pulled me away, and certainly there's times I've been distracted, uh, that I think my kids know that I'm doing my best to lead a purposeful life and become a mindful person. And I think that, that counts for something with them. I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll check that out with the munchkin later. <laughs> um, all, of the, uh, all of the students who, who are here, uh, in order to get in uh, to the GSB, had to answer a question which has become customary for us to ask our guests, which is, what matters most to you and why? I hate questions like that. Um, the, uh, you know, at, at Davida, people sometimes say, well, what matters more, you know, the, keeping the profits up and the stock price up or the village? And I say, as a mayor, that's a false dichotomy. It's like, what's more important to you, air or water? You, you have to have both. I mean, to say one's more important than the other is, is a, I think, a, a, a paradigm that defies reality. And so, so I would say three. One is... Uh, there, there is nothing more special than the, the people you love and love you. And the older you get, I'm, I'm a couple months from 60, the more significant that, that, that is. Uh, and what you sow, so shall you reap. Uh, you know, at the, by the time you get to my age, a lot of stuff is locked and loaded in terms of the depth and breadth of your friendships and the texture of those friendships and your relationships with your family and your kids and your, your spouse. Uh, second, is to try to become uh, mind, more mindful each day, you know, to tread gently on the planet and the, the people in it. This is a particularly difficult one for me, uh, but, but there's, there's a Buddhist saying that strictly, that strictly speaking, there are no spiritual people, there's only spiritual practices. And people who act in a humane, mindful, gentle way every day, all day, send amazing cumulative ripples through the course of their life. And so for me, that's a, that's a particular challenge, and I'm proud of the progress I've made because it's so important. And then third is the more macro of what impact you have on, on the world. Uh, and particularly for people in this room, you know, spectacular capabilities, spectacular experiences, uh, and 
and spectacular luck in getting to come to a place like this with people like you're sitting with. And so I, I sincerely hope that many of you take on the incremental responsibility on top of the first two of, of trying to have a, a significant impact on the world. Great, great answer on, on all three points. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd, you'd like to share with, uh, with this crowd? Well, for me, I mean, it's an honor to be here. I mean, when I was, when I was in those seats uh, in 1981 to 83, uh, it was my dream that maybe one day I get to come back and talk to, excuse me, kids like you uh, about important topics. So for me, getting to be here and be here with Garth and Charles O'Reilly and Joel Peterson and others is, is like a, a dream. So I, I really encourage young people, think about your dreams and don't give up on them because sometimes they come true. They are rarely easy. Uh, they're rarely linear to go after, but for me, many of the dreams I had when I was your age have come true, uh, and I feel so, so lucky. Uh, and the second thing I would say is just to, with all the ambitions and the pressures of two career couples and having babies and, you know, been through all that, uh, to really savor the adventure of life. There's a, there was a French author, Colette, who, who said, I had a wonderful life. I only wished I'd realized it sooner. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.